Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lecture we're going to do another just-in-time review session and this one's in preparation for related rates problems. So related rates problems are problems that we're going to study in the next lecture. What we're going to do here is we're going to form a bit of the foundations that we need in order to solve those problems. Now, a related rates problem, in short, is just a problem where you've got essentially two quantities. Each of them is changing in time. And you know that the quantities depend on each other. You know that they're related in some way. So if I know how fast one quantity is changing, the fact that they're related, I should be able to determine how fast the other quantity is changing. And so that's the goal of the related rates problem, is to figure out if I know how fast one quantity is changing, how fast is the other one changing. Now, in order to attack a related rates problem, they're often given in some sort of verbal form, so given as a word problem. We're going to have to pull out or extract the information from that word problem and put it in a mathematical form that we can then start to work with. Well, this section is all about taking the verbal description of a problem and putting it into symbolic form or mathematical form or drawing some diagrams or just extracting that information out. So that's all I'm going to focus on here. So we're going to look at word problems and try to extract the relevant information out. This is going to form the foundation because later when we, in the next lecture, when we look at related race problems, that's going to have to sort of be the automatic stage. We're going to have to be able to pull this information out. We're going to have to be able to write it all down. And then we apply our techniques of calculus at that point. So you can think of this as sort of the preliminary or the setup stage for a related race problem. So let's go ahead and look at some examples. So in this first example, a six-foot tall man walks away from a 15-foot lamppost and the man's shadow is cast on the ground. Okay, so there's a description of a situation. What we want to do is we want to draw a picture to represent the situation, identify and label all constants and variables, and then we want to determine a relationship between the distance from the man to the lamppost and the length of the man's shadow. So come up with a relationship between the quantities that we introduced, that were introduced in the problem. Okay, so we've got a lamppost. So here's our lamppost. And we've got a man that's walking away from a lamppost. So there's our man walking away from the lamppost. And there's a shadow that's cast on the ground. So how do we get the shadow? Well, there's a the beam of light that just clips the top of the man's head. It's going to be the part of the shadow, which represents the top of the man's head, so the length of the full shadow. So it's going to look something like this. Here's our full shadow. So there's our full shadow there. Now what do we know? We know a few things. We know that the man is six feet tall, so that distance there is six. We know that the lamppost is 15 feet tall. We are interested in the length of the man's shadow. So that's this distance here. And let's call that S. So let S be the length of the man's shadow. And we already see the distance from the man to the lamppost should be called x from the next question, so we'll throw that in here as well. There's x. So let x be the distance from the man to the lamppost. So the idea here is I've introduced some variables in my diagram. I should also declare them verbally, what those variables represent. Just to be clear to the reader, when I throw an x in here, what does it represent? It is the distance from the man to the lamppost. What does s represent? It's the length of the man's shadow. Okay, so have we done everything? We've drawn a picture to represent the situation, yes. We've identified and labeled all constants. Yeah, the two constants that were given were 15 and 6. They're in there. And all variables. Well, it seems that I need the distance from the man to the lamppost, because that was asked about in the second part, and the length of the man's shadow, because that was 
given, well, it's asked about in the second part as well, but it was also indicated in the statement of the question. So it looks like I've done part A. What is part B? Determine the relationship between the distance x from the man to the lamppost and the length of the man's shadow. Okay, so now we need a relationship between x and s. So what's our relationship? Well, from this diagram, you know, sometimes when we draw the diagram, we add a little bit too much detail, which could cloud sort of the connection between the variables. So I'm going to extract just the pure geometric relationships I have. So I'm staring at a situation like this, where that's 15, that's 6, that's x from there to there, and that's s from there to there. And so what we see is that there's a similar set of similar triangles here, a small triangle and the big right triangle. And so we have that by similar triangles. The height of the big one over the base of the big one, that's x plus s, is equal to the height of the small one over the base of the small one. And I'm interested in a relationship between the distance x and the variable s. So there's a relationship, but I could simplify it a little bit. 15s is equal to 6x plus 6s. Or in other words, 9s is equal to 6x. Or in other words, 3 halves s is equal to x. So maybe I'll write it as x is equal to 3 halves s. So there's our relationship. We could write it in another way. Perhaps it makes more sense to write the length of the shadow in terms of the distance x. So s is equal to 2 thirds of x. And so there is our relationship. Okay, so we've taken the verbal problem and we extracted from it the relevant information in terms of a diagram, the relationships, and then we also constructed um, the algebraic relationships between the variables. Okay, so started with a word problem and converted it into mathematics. Let's look at the next example. So an airplane is flying at a constant altitude, nine kilometers above the ground, and is approaching a camera on the ground. So it's flying at a constant altitude. So there's my airplane. It's flying at a constant altitude above the ground. So this is 9 kilometers. It's approaching a camera on the ground. So the camera on the ground has got to be over here somewhere. So there's my camera. Looking at it. So there's a camera. Let Theta be the angle of elevation above the ground at which the camera is pointed. So the camera is going to be pointed at the plane. And so theta is our angle of elevation. Find a relationship between the horizontal distance from the plane to the camera and the angle of elevation. So we've got this horizontal distance here, which we'll call x. So I've put a variable in my diagram. I better declare it. Let x be the distance from camera to plane. And we can even be more specific. It's supposed to be the horizontal. It's the horizontal distance. And so we're asked to find a relationship between the horizontal distance from the plane to the camera and the angle of elevation. So we want a relationship between x and theta. Relationship between x and theta. So what's our relationship? Well, our diagram, we've got theta, 9, and x. So from our diagram, we see that this is a right triangle. We know two side lengths, the legs, and the angle. So that's a tangent relationship. So tan of theta is 9 over x. And there's the relationship that we're looking for. Okay, so what about the next example? 
Suppose that the wood nymphs and the satires are having a hot party and the wine is flowing freely from the bottom of a giant cone-shaped barrel, which is 10 feet high and 6 feet in radius at the top. Determine the relationship between the depth and the volume of the wine in the tank. So we've got this giant cone. And the radius is 6 feet at the top. It's 10 feet high. And it's filled with wine. So it's going to look something like this. And the wine is draining out through the bottom of the uh, yeah, the wine is flowing freely from the bottom, so it's the wine is draining out from the bottom of the tank. And we're interested in, in figuring out what the volume is, what is the volume of the wine in terms of the height, so the relationship between V and H. So we're going to have to, we've introduced our variables, we'll declare them. Let V be the volume of wine in the tank. And let H be the depth. You're wondering maybe why didn't I use D? Well, D already has a special place in calculus in, in, as a derivative in our Leibniz notation. So I'm going to use H for the depth of the wine in the tank. And now I want to find a relationship between these two. So what's our relationship between V and H? So again, I'm going to take this picture. I'm going to try to extract the relevant bits from it that are going to be helpful in coming up with this relationship. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice the tank by a plane right down the middle and then project it into sort of two dimensions. So I'm looking at half of the cone flattened so that this is H, this is 10, and now this is essentially the radius of the top which was 6. And I'd like to know this distance here. So what's this distance? I will call this R because it's essentially the radius of this uh, surface, the circle at the surface of the wine. So now I'd like to find the relationship between V and H. Well, I know that V is equal to the volume of a cone is 1 third pi R squared times the height of the cone. So there's our volume of our cone. I want this entirely in terms of h, so I need to come up with an expression for r in terms of h. Well, I know that r over h is equal to 6 over 10 by similar triangles there. So that means r is equal to divide 2 into each of these, so that's 3 fifths h. So having that relationship, we can plug it into the volume, and I get that it's 1 third pi times 3 fifth squared h squared times h, so that's h cubed. Or in other words, well, 1 3 cancels with one of the 3's that's being squared, so it's 3 pi by 25 h cubed. And there is our relationship between v and h. Okay, so let's look at the next example. A baseball player runs from home plate towards first base. Determine the relationship between the distance x from the player to first base and the distance y from the player to second base. So let's look at our baseball diamond here. So our square, there's our bases. And so this will be home. And therefore this is first base, this is second base, and this is third base. A player runs from home plate towards first base, so our player is running 
in that direction there. Determine the relationship between the distance from the player to first base and the distance from the player to second base. So we're interested in this distance and this distance. So let's call one of them x and one of them y. So we'll let x be the distance from player to first base and let y be the distance from player to second base. What's the relationship that we have? So relationship between x and y. How can I relate x and y? Well, it looks like, if I include the line from first to second, it looks like we're sitting on a right triangle here. So it looks like that. And so that's y, that's x. But I don't seem to have a third quantity in here to come up with a relationship. Well, I do have a third quantity. It's just not given anywhere in the question. And the third quantity is that we know the distance between the bases are all constants. This is a square, so the distance between the bases is a constant. It depends on which field you're playing on, whether you're playing you know, at the younger age category um, or you're playing in sort of the major leagues. So let's just say that C is the length between bases. In the major leagues, it's 90 feet. Um, in the younger age groups, it could drop anywhere down to like 60 feet. Um, so, but the point is, is that it's just some constant. So it's some constant C. So C, which is some constant. And so our relationship is that y squared is equal to x squared plus c squared. And there we go. So let's look at our next example. We have a plane that's flying at a constant speed of 300 kilometers per hour. It passes over a ground radar station at an altitude of one kilometer and climbs at an angle of 30 degrees. So there's our ground. Here's our radar station. The plane passes over it. So there's the point where it passes over it. Let's say it's flying to the right. And then it starts to climb at an angle of 30 degrees. So it's going to climb along something like this. So there's our 30 degrees. And so our plane is somewhere out here, flying in that direction. If P denotes the location of the plane of the plane when it passes directly over the radar station, so that's our point P. Determine the relationship between the distance from the radar station to the plane. Okay, so that's this distance here radar station to the plane, and the distance from the plane to the point P. So that's that's distance here. Okay, so we're interested in these distances. So let's give them some names. I'll call this one Y, this one X. So let X be the distance from the plane to the radar station. And let y be the distance from p to plane. Now we want to come up with a relationship between these two distances. So how can we do that? So I'll get rid of the ground here. What's our relationship between x and y? So I'll extract the relevant bits from our diagram. 
Oh, one thing I didn't put in here was this is one kilometer. So that's one. This is y. This is x. What's this angle here? Well, it's 30 degrees off of the horizontal. That's a full 90. So this is 120 degrees. So there's my triangle, which I should be able to determine the relationship between x and y from this object. How can I do that? Well, I noticed that it's not a right triangle. If it was a right triangle, I'd have the Pythagorean theorem, but it's not a right triangle. But the law of cosines is essentially the generalization of the Pythagorean theorem to arbitrary triangles. And so I'm going to use that. So by the law of cosines, we have the following. What does the law of cosines say? Well, it says, take the angle that you know. The side opposite that angle, you can think of that by an analogy as like the, the hypotenuse, if you want to think of it as how this is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. So it's the side opposite the angle you know, x squared, is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the other two sides. So that's essentially the Pythagorean theorem. But now this is the adjustment factor because the angle wasn't 90. And so that would be minus 2 times the lengths of the two sides that are adjacent to this angle times the cosine of the angle. And so that's the law of cosines. And so this means that x squared is equal to 1 plus y squared minus 2y times cosine of 120. What's cosine of 120? Well, it might help to think of it in terms of our unit circle. 120 degrees is 90 degrees plus another 30, so it's over here. And so that angle from there to there is 30 degrees. And cosine is this x coordinate of that point. So you can think of it as coming from the sine of 30 degrees sine of 30 degrees would be that distance there. And so what's the sine of 30 degrees? Well, the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. So the cosine of 120 should be negative 1 half. And so this becomes then plus, and then I can get rid of the 2 because it would have canceled with the half. And so there is our relationship between x and y. So this required us to use the law of cosines. If you don't remember the law of cosines and you want just a quick refresher of it, I've recorded a quick little video where I go through the proof of the law of cosines and you can find that video below. All right, so that was a number of examples where we took a verbal description of a situation. We extracted from that a diagram which represented it. We tried to figure out what variables we needed and then we got some relationships, some mathematical relationship between those variables. That's essentially the first step in solving a related rates problem. So this is what we've done here is going to be very helpful when we get to these full-blown related rates problems in the next section. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to look at some more verbal descriptions of problems where a rate is given in the problem and try to interpret that rate in terms of a derivative of the variables we introduce. So this is sort of the next step in unpacking information from the problem. Now we're given a rate in the problem. How do we unpack from that a derivative. So for example, here in this problem we were given a rate, 300 kilometers per hour. I should be able to recognize that as a derivative of one of my quantities. What is it the derivative of? What quantity has a derivative of 300? So that's what we're going to do now in our next video.